to uh, uh, first of all to say this Monday tomorrow um, we're starting something new. Uh, it's called the International Conversation Cafe. Um, it's really just a chance for um, people who don't have English as a first language, and many of them live around Charleston, uh, to come along and uh, to meet one another, but also to uh, spend time, I guess, just learning English. And uh, it'll be a great thing to invite people to. So if you know folks in the scheme who are international, um, and English doesn't, if you're English, that doesn't, does that, does that count as international? He can't really speak Dundonian. Uh, <laughs> get, we'll get him, James can come. For the, yeah, okay. Um, so if you know anyone, uh, we've got a lot of uh, Nigerian families, a lot of uh, Syrian families, a lot of uh, families from uh, Poland and Eastern Europe, if you know anyone who kind of uh, basically isn't from Charleston, let's say, we'll classify them as internationals, um, come along and uh, even if you're from, Storno, um, from the Western Isles, you can come. Uh, this will be a great chance just to kind of connect. We've got a huge international community here. We really want to connect with them and um, uh, get to know them. So please do take a flyer if you know friends, family, neighbours who could come along to that. That's tomorrow at one o'clock. Please do pray for it. Please advertise it far and wide. Think of people you know, uh, particularly in the scheme here, who can come along to that um, and it should be good. Uh, this Wednesday as well, we're doing home group Bible study groups, home Bible study groups. Um, it's starting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. We're going to be uh, doing that twice a month, just meeting in someone's home. It's a bit of a smaller group, more intimate, doing a Bible study. And that's starting at 7. Um, if you want to come to that, you know, it's good to get an idea of names so that we can assign people to different groups. Um, so Tim is going to be around with, this, with a little sign-up sheet at the end. So I would normally just get people to sign up, but people forget. So Tim's going to go around and get names and stuff. And if you would like to come, that's starting this Wednesday. And uh, we'll be doing that twice a month. Um, so we'll be doing home group. And then the following Wednesday, we're doing the prayer meeting where we eat together and then home group. So that's how it's going to work uh, each month. So um, I think that'll be a great thing to come along to. Again, great thing maybe you can invite people to as well. A lot of the stuff that we do is during the day. Um, and so this will be a great opportunity for folks to come who are working during the day and can't make any of the uh, normal things that we run as a church. Um, that's starting this Wednesday. Please do speak to Tim. Please uh, sign up for that. And we'll be looking through the book of 1 Peter together. Um, final thing to say, or sec sorry, I've got a lot of notices. The 2nd of December, Saturday the 2nd of December, we're doing a vision day as a church. We're going to look at particularly evangelism and um, I guess training and how we can do evangelism better both in this community and in the places that God has um, placed us. Um, and it'll be a chance just to uh, be together, eat together and to kind of um, get the vision of why we're here back at the forefront of our minds and encourage one another to work towards that vision. So that's just the date for the diary, 2nd of December, Saturday the 2nd of December be a vision day. It'll just be in the morning. We'll be finished by the afternoon and we'll have lunch together then. Uh, probably, yeah. yeah. It is, not probably, definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we, if you're wanting to come along to that and you need lifts and stuff, we'll organise lifts for people um, and we'll get you down to St. Pete's and uh, have the vision day there. Um, and finally, final thing to say is we do have uh, uh, Kids Church is on this afternoon at three o'clock. Um, so that's for anyone primary aged. We don't have Sunday school because we don't have enough space. Um, but it is on at three o'clock, three to four. We've got kids church on. So uh, loads of stuff there, um, lots of stuff happening, and it's good to uh, pray about these things. And um, there's lots of literature at the back you can take as well. I'm going to read some words now just to lead us into a time of worship. We're going to sing these words at the end of our service, um, but these words come from Psalm 93. This is what it says, Psalm 93. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. 
The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea is the Lord on high. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. We're going to begin our service by uh, reminding ourselves of who God is, who Jesus is, and what he has done for us, and how we are completely dependent upon him. So let's stand together and we'll sing, Yet Not I, But Christ Through Me.
Please do have a seat. We're going to pray now as we begin our service. Every week we like to pray for a different uh, country and a different church that we are associated with. Uh, this week we're going to pray for um, uh, the nation we're going to pray for this week is the nation of Sri Lanka. 21 million people there, about 1.2% of the population would be uh, evangelical Christians. We're going to pray for that nation. Um, some of the prayer points we've got here are uh, Buddhist extremism has grown in this multi-regious, multi-ethnic country. Uh, many reacted to Tamil violence, to Muslim growth, or to inappropriate methods of Christian evangelism. And so persecution against Christian comes in waves, and at least 250 churches were destroyed or damaged in recent years. We want to pray, therefore, for the church in that nation. We'll pray that it will grow. There has been... Um, uh, significant church growth in Sri Lanka over the past few years. We want to praise God for that and praise, uh, pray for um, just depth as well for the church, as well as breadth, if that makes sense. Um, this is also, uh, we are part of an organization, um, we're linked to an organization called 20 Schemes, which is an organization that wants to plant churches and housing schemes across Scotland. I've just thought, so, I don't know why it's called 20 Schemes. What's yeah, because I think we're like 16 at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're we'll have to change the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is like they're doing a big push this Sunday. They've called it Scheme Sunday. Um, so we're going to pray for all the churches that are currently um, being established uh, and are part of that network. I was just thinking about it. I've got a list of them here. Um, and obviously we're not going to go into detail because, we'll, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, Barlanoch is, is one of them. I was just thinking, like, it is amazing to think, you know, that um, 10 years ago, uh, yeah, 10 or 15 years ago, none of these churches existed. And now they're there and people's lives are being changed. The gospel's going out in these areas. And just we just want to praise God for that. Um, and, of course, we'll pray for ourselves. Many people struggling with sickness. I want to pray as well for Maisie. I pray that God would continue to help her after her fall. Uh, my wee boy Finlay as well. He's had his tonsils taken out, um, but he's in a lot of pain. So, yeah, a lot of people sick, struggling, and we'll pray for ourselves as well. Plenty of things to pray for there. So let's pray as we begin our service. Father, as we uh, come to worship you this morning, we need to just quiet our hearts and think about who you are. Uh, Father, so often we come on Sundays and there's a lot of things going on in our head, a lot of issues, a lot of difficulties, a lot of worries, a lot of anxieties. And Father, we just need to see you. As we read in that psalm at the start, we are reminded of who you are, robed in majesty, armed with strength, the great God who established this world, the one who is mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, Lord, you stand above all the chaos and darkness and you are in complete control, sovereign over everything. Father, we do not approach a tame God this morning. We approach the one who has existed for all eternity, the great and powerful God, perfect in holiness and goodness. And Father, if we just think about who you are we see ourselves in light of that and we are reminded of who we are weak and frail finite limited and sinful and so father as your church we want to confess to you that we have sinned we want to confess this past week that we've let you down so many different ways we've let you down father and we're not here to pretend because we don't have it sorted we are sinners and we need a saviour. And Father, there's ways that we have let you down and, and how we've thought and what we've said and what we've done. And Father, we're ashamed of it and we bring that sin to you now and we confess it to you in the quiet of our hearts. And yet, Father, as we do that, we also want to acknowledge that that sin has been wiped clean, that Jesus Christ has saved us from everything that is wrong with us that he has taken the punishment we deserve upon his own shoulders so that it would never have to touch us. Father, you are great in might and power and you are great in love and grace. And we praise you 
that we are forgiven and we praise you that we can speak to you now as our heavenly father that we have that relationship with the creator of this entire world thank you jesus for that father we want to pray the good news of the gospel of salvation we pray that would go out to the nations this morning we want to pray in particular for the nation of sri lanka Father, we pray for Christians who are struggling. We read that at least 250 churches have been damaged or destroyed in recent years. We pray for the churches that are feeling demoralized and deflated. Father, help them see that there is nothing that will stop the growth of your church, that the gospel will go out to the nations. Give your church in Sri Lanka confidence in your power, Jesus, and in the good news of your gospel. Father, thank you for the growing evangelical movements and many Protestant denominations out there. And we pray that this relatively small Christian community would continue to produce many good quality leaders and thinkers that would help your church. Father, we want to pray for the Lanka Tamil community, once relatively prosperous, but now undone and scattered by violence that they have faced. Father, there's over 700,000 of them dispersed and we want to pray for the many churches among them to be forces for the evangelization of Sri Lanka. Father, we pray for the estate Tamils who have long been despised and poverty-stricken, a marginalized community in that nation. Father, thank you for the outreach that has been done among them and would it continue to proclaim the hope of the gospel and would Jesus' church thrive in that nation? Father, closer to home, we want to pray for um, the organization, 20 Schemes. We want to pray specifically for all the churches that are connected with that organization. Father, over in Glasgow on the West Coast, we thank you for Bailiston, for Kilwinnon, for Hairstains, for Lamb Hill, for Berlanark, for Govan, for Onthank and Kilmarnock, these churches that have started, many of them new churches. We praise you for that. Thank you for what you've done in Edinburgh, in Nidri, and in Bingham, and in Trenent, and in Gracemount. Thank you for what you are doing here in Dundee, in Charleston, in Loch Ee, and what you have done up in uh, Inverness, in Markinch. And Father, we see these areas, we, we know them, we, we love places like Charleston, and we see that there's just a desperate need, and that need is for the gospel, with all the issues and difficulties that people and schemes across Scotland face, we know that ultimately what they need is the hope of Jesus. And so, Father, we want to praise you for these churches. And we praise you that people's lives have been changed and transformed, that life and light and hope and joy has radiated out from them. And Father, we pray that we continue to grow. 20 is too small a number. We pray for many, many more churches and the schemes across our nation. And we pray that Jesus would be glorified through them. Father, we want to pray for ourselves as well. Many sick, many hurting, many struggling. And we pray, Almighty God, that even just today as we come to study your word, that we would know a peace that surpasses understanding, that only Jesus Christ can give us. Pray for Maisie, Finlay. Pray that your healing hand would be upon them. Father, pray for any who are struggling with their mental health and various other things. Please would we see Jesus today and would he give us peace and comfort and joy. It's in his name we ask. Amen. 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 Okay, folks, if you have a Bible, please can you open it up to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, we're doing a series looking through uh, this next section of Matthew's Gospel, 14 through 18. So uh, we have some new Bibles, but helpfully they've got similar page numbers. So if you've got um, the, lar oh, sorry, the, large, the new large print Bibles with the blue cover, uh, 981, 981 I think it is, uh, that's the same as my one, the Pebble Beach Bibles. So many different Bibles. That's 981. If you've got one of these or you've got one of the big blue ones, 981. Well, they're, they're, they've, they're used. They're being used. Eh? Bullies are three of them. 
<laughs> um, I don't, sorry, Rachel, where are the big Bibles? They're in the office, I think. They should have been out. If you would like a big print Bible for next week, speak to me. I'll get you one. Um, Matthew 14. So if you do have a big print one, if you do have a Pebble Beach one, it's 981. If you have a mountain Bible, which is the one you've got, Billy, that's page 739. 739. Um, and if you've got another Bible of a different cover, I can't help you. <laughs> Go to the index. <laughs> Matthew 14. Matthew 14. We're going to read from verse 22 to verse 23 of this chapter. It's just a great, great passage today. Um, uh, we, we've read it this week. There's been a lot of stuff going on this week and just been comforted. Um, myself and Kyrene just through reading this passage together. Um, let me just frame it a wee bit before we dive in. Matthew 14 to 18, this is a section of Matthew's gospel that is all about how in the face of difficulty and hostility, Jesus is going to assemble his people and build his church. Uh, so at the back we have wee handouts showing you the structure of Matthew's gospel. For both of you that are interested in that, you can have a look. Um, but these chapters are all about how Jesus is going to build his church in a time of great difficulty. Matthew splits his gospel up into uh, five sections, and that's what this section is all about. And so the key verse is actually in chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus takes Peter aside and says, You are Peter, and on you I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. Nothing will stop the good news of Jesus' salvation advancing out to the nations. And so this is a really encouraging part of Matthew's gospel, explaining how that's going to happen. What we'll see in these chapters is an overwhelming display of Jesus' power. Um, at this point in Matthew, the miracles kind of get ramped up, and Jesus does stuff that is incredible. But what we also see in this chapter is this extraordinary display of Jesus' compassion and the care that he has for all those who follow him. Uh, now, the one person who's mentioned all throughout in this section is Peter. In many ways, he is like the representation of Jesus' church. He has, uh, he has some good moments, and he has, many, uh, he has many moments where he fluffs it, which is why uh, we love him, because <laughs> he just puts his foot in it, and you'll see him do that today. And these bad moments, they're there to remind us that it's not about us. Even the best of us will be a failure. And it's not about us, it's about Jesus and what he does for us. So this story we're about to read very much reinforces that. If we're to keep going amidst the chaos and the difficulties of life, if we are to see Jesus' church built, we need to have a focus that is not on ourselves and our failings, but on Christ and his power. Let's read it. Matthew 14, verse 22. Jesus has just miraculously fed 5,000 people from heaven uh, with a feast from heaven. A feast that brought life, and this is what happens next. Verse 22. So immediately after this, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. This is God's word. We're going to uh, look at that word together. But just before we do, we're going to sing again a song called Cornerstone, a song that reminds us 
that our hope is built completely upon Jesus and not ourselves. So let's stand and we'll sing this song together and then we'll study God. seat. Get your Bibles back open on that um, little passage that we read, Matthew 14, 22 to 33. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Sometimes there are moments in life, um, I guess, often there are moments that can feel overwhelming. 
uh, moments that cause great fear and uncertainty. Uh, this is just a small example from, from this week from myself. I know there's probably greater examples that many of you will have uh, be going through right now, possibly, or have gone through. Uh, our wee boy, as I mentioned, Finlay, had to get his tonsils and adenoids removed. It's a fairly standard, normal procedure. Um, many of you will have had it done. And so we knew that. We knew that going in that it was pretty safe, pretty standard thing to do. But see when it's your own kids, knowing that, you panic. Um, I don't think I really knew fear as much as I did um, since becoming a parent. And um, there was a panic. And sometimes in life, you can get in situations where that panic increases and it causes you to spiral. And life just gets hard. And as a follower of Jesus, often in those difficult and fearful moments, when you are afraid, when you do feel overwhelmed, those are the moments where doubt can creep in. You see, it's not just that life can be hard, because it is for everyone, but here's what Jesus will teach us. It's really hard if you want to follow him and live for him. Really hard. I mean, it is the best thing you can do. It's life and love and eternal hope. It's truth. But we follow a God who was crucified. And that means that we will face difficulty. We will face opposition for his sake. And he tells us at the end of Matthew's gospel, this is his commission to us, that we are to go out to the nations and tell them the good news of his salvation. He tells us, as we've seen in this section of Matthew, that he is going to build his church. But sometimes everything is so overwhelming that it's hard to see how that could be possible. The opposition, the indifference to Jesus is just everywhere and we're struggling to do his mission, struggling to live for him, struggling with fear, struggling with doubt. Well, this passage in Matthew 14 is a helpful place to go if that's you. You see, when fear overwhelms us, here's what a lot of people would say. You just need to believe in yourself. Let me say that's probably the worst advice you can get. For one simple reason, we are so weak and so limited and no amount of self-confidence will change that fact. It's like if I say, I really believe that I could fly and then I fling myself off a building, you wouldn't say, wow, he was so confident. You would say, yeah, you would say, what a fool. No matter how much I believed in myself, what a fool, you can't do that. You see, when it comes to living for Jesus and being part of his church and seeking to make him known, here's the truth. We don't need to increase our self-confidence. We need to increase our Christ-confidence. We need to see Jesus. And folks, that's what Matthew will teach us in this chapter. Yes, Jesus' church will prevail. Yes, it will advance. Yes, it will go out to the nations, the gospel. Yes, he will save and rescue people. And we can be 100% confident in that, not because of us and who we are and what we do. We can be 100% confident because of Christ and what he has done. He is the one who stands above the storms. And so with this story here, two simple truths. Firstly, who is Jesus? And secondly, how should we respond? Two simple truths. Who is Jesus and how should we respond? So here's our first point. Are we okay with the chairs? The new, the new chair set up, Chris Minor. <laughs> um, Jesus is the great I am. That's the first thing. That's the big thing that we're meant to see in this story. Um, what do I mean by that? Jesus is the great I am. What do I mean by that? Let me explain. So Jesus, at this point in Matthew's gospel, has miraculously fed a crowd of around 15,000 people, if you include women and children, with five loaves of bread and two fish. And here we read in our passage, verse 22, immediately he got his disciples to go in a boat. And he said to them, look lads, I need to go, I need to have a wee time away just to, to pray. Remember in uh, verse 13 that we saw last time in Matthew uh, chapter 14, his cousin John the Baptist had just been killed. He was wanting some time alone to pray, but then the crowds descended on them and Jesus fed them. 
Well, now he's needing that time again just to be alone, to pray with God his Father. So he's going to go up a mountain to pray. And he's saying to the disciples, you boys head along to the other side of the lake and I'll meet you there. Um, he goes up at night time. The disciples head out on the boat. We're told that they were a considerable distance from land. So this is probably about three miles out in the water. This is the, the Sea of Galilee, by the way. It was around about six miles wide. So it's big. The disciples are a considerable distance from the land. They're right in the middle, three miles out in the water. And whilst they are out there, they get hit with a furious storm. Now, these disciples, there's just details in here that are worth noticing. These disciples set out in the evening. And when Jesus approaches them, it's coming up to dawn. So they're probably in this storm for about six hours battling the elements. And let me say something about them as well. These guys are not first-time rookie sailors. They're professional fishermen. They know storms. They know how to handle it. So this storm that is hitting them is not just a little breeze and a little drizzle of rain. This is full pelt danger territory. This is Storm Babette magnified or Storm Kieran now magnify this is fight for your life type stuff they're battling against the elements they've been doing it probably for about six hours and whilst this is going on they're in the chaos they're in the storm whilst this is going on something extraordinary happens and the way that Matthew writes it it's almost like if you blink you're going to miss it if you zone out a little bit in the reading, you've just missed something extraordinary. And he puts it in one verse. And let me say, if this verse is true, it changes everything about how you understand yourself, about how you understand God, and about how you understand the entire universe. One verse, verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Walking on top of the lake on top of water, in the middle of a storm. He just did that. Just a sentence for Matthew. And yet you can miss it. The disciples didn't miss it though, did they? There they are. They're battling the elements. The lightning's flashing across the sky. The wind is howling. The waves are tossing the boat. Rain battering down on them. And you can imagine them, as they are doing this, trying to stay alive, as they are fighting this, they look out. And in the, in the, the dusk, in the, the light that is just coming before the dawn, they see a silhouette appearing off in the distance among the waves. What's that? And it gets closer. And it looks like a person. And I think they react how I would react. They obviously like watching horror films like I do because their reaction is immediately, it's a ghost. They don't think this is a person because people do not walk on top of water. But as the figure gets close to them, they hear these words, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Jesus is there standing before them on top of the waves. And literally, actually, here's what he says. He says, take courage, I am. Which is what in Greek, James? Ego I me in Greek. There you go, you've learned some Greek, ancient Greek. Take courage, ego I me, I am. And it's that phrase that's probably the most shocking thing about this entire scene. Do you know why? You see, in the book of Exodus, in the Old Testament, when God, is, you're right, Billy, when God assembled his people Israel, he told them his name. And he said to them, through his servant Moses, my name is I am who I am. And that was the name that he was known by, I am. Uh, here, here's some more ancient language for you. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh. Whenever you see Lord in your Bibles, all with capital letters, that's not his title, that's his name, that's Yahweh, that's I am. And so after revealing his name to Moses, God saved his people, he assembled them as his nation. And do you know what he did? He miraculously fed them with bread from heaven, and then he led them to the shores of the Red Sea, Exodus 14, he parted the waters, controlled the waves, so that his people could pass through safe and unharmed. 
What's happening here in Matthew 14? Jesus has called himself, I am. What's he doing in this section of Matthew? He's assembling his people, building his church. What has he just done before this? He's miraculously fed them with bread from heaven. And what does he do now? He stands on top of the waters. Can you see what Matthew is telling us? He didn't live there, Lord. Yeah, this isn't just some guy. This is not just some ruler. This is not just some teacher. Jesus is God. And not just any God, but the very same God who rescued his people Israel out of slavery all those years ago. Here we have the I am in the flesh. In fact, this story has so many parallels with what we see of God in the Old Testament. Let me just show you a few, just to convince you. You might not be convinced. Well, let me show you. This is what Job chapter 9 verse 8 says. Oh, you'll, oh, never mind the big print Bible. You're going to need a telescope to read that. Just uh, let me read it, and you can come up at the end and look at it later. God alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. God alone. People don't do that. God does that. Job 9 verse 8. We're going to see in a minute, Peter sinking, and he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me, and Jesus reaches in and pulls him out of the water. Look at this from Psalm 18 verse 16. The Lord reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of the deep waters. The Lord, I am, drew me out of deep waters. What about this from Psalm 69 verse 1? Save me, O my God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. He's sinking. He cries out, God, save me. And I am jumps in, saves him, rescues him. Or this from Isaiah 43, where God says this, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am Yahweh, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. It's so clear. Do you know there are some people who say that the gospel writers never actually say that Jesus is God? <laughs> Give me a break. You'd have to be incredibly ignorant of the Bible to think that. In fact, this is probably one of the most explicit portrayals of Christ's divinity. Anyone with any knowledge knows exactly what's going on with Jesus here. Exactly what he's saying. And these disciples, these Jewish men, get it. Because look at what they do in verse 33. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. You have to see this. If there was one group in the ancient world who would never, ever have worshipped a man as God, it would have been the Jews. They never would have done it. The one thing every Jewish person agreed on was that there's one God and he alone is to be worshipped. And yet here we see these 12 Jewish men bowing before this man, worshipping him. Folks, Jesus is not just some good teacher. He's not some political freedom fighter. He's not just some figure from ancient history. He is the God who made the heavens and the earth. He is the one whom the wind and the waves answer to. The I am, eternal and everlasting. He is the one who upholds holds and sustains every single atom in this universe. Do you see what that means? It means that the God who made you and I, who knows why we are here and where we are going, has broken into human history as one of us. You can know him. He is there standing above the storm. This is the one that we are made for. We don't need to stumble about in the dark trying to figure it out. God has come to us. He's come to you, and he calls you to come to him. And look, maybe you've already done that. Maybe you did that a long time ago. But do you see who he is? I know we, we say it all the time, Jesus is God. But do we grasp the magnitude of that? Our view of him can become so small. And we let our fears and our doubts become so big. The storm is big when we view him as small. But when we see who he really is and how he stands above it all, it shrinks everything else down. 
Jesus, the God who stands above the waves, is the one who has come to save you, who watches over you, who will guide you and protect you, and who will make sure that you get home. He is not distant or weak. He is the great eternal God, and he will build his church. Of course he will. Who could stop him? We need to not look to ourselves. This is the key. We need to look to him. And when we see him, as I am, as the God who stands above the waves, here's how we should respond. This is the second point. Three ways. Firstly, don't be afraid. That's what he says, isn't it? Fear's dominating everything in this uh, little story. But he says the first words to the disciples, take courage. He says it twice. Take courage. I am. Don't be afraid. Do you know, um, all throughout the Bible, the sea is used as a metaphor for chaos and evil and darkness. So, um, actually, just look back at these Bible references. Let me go back a bit. Uh, when David speaks in Psalm 18 and Psalm 69 of sinking and the water coming up to his neck, he, he's not being literal there. He's not talking about a bad day at the swimming pool. He would have had many of them because there's a lot of Psalms where he says that. But you read the rest of the Psalms, you can see it's a poetic image. And what is it used to describe? It's used to describe the feeling of helplessness that comes from being surrounded by enemies and hostility. It feels like he's drowning. And when God says in Isaiah 43 at the end there that I will be with you when you pass through water and fire. Again, it's not literal. He's not saying following Jesus makes you waterproof and fireproof. In Isaiah, God is saying to Israel, look, even though you've made a mess, even though you're surrounded by evil, even though it's a complete disaster all around you, I am going to be with you through all of that and I will make sure that you pass through and I will save you. I will get you through all the opposition you might face. Now listen, Jesus literally did walk on water. It's no metaphor. He, he did that, literally. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a magic trick. He walked for three miles, by the way, three miles on stormy waves. But he did that to prove to us and to prove to the disciples that he is this God who saves. And because that's who he is, we can know he stands above all the chaos in our lives and in our world. No matter what darkness, no matter what evil, no matter what trials, no matter what difficulty we will face, no matter the brokenness, the hurt, the suffering, the opposition the church goes through, there is one man, one God, who stands supreme above it all, who controls it all, and who will save his people through it all. The same Jesus who walks on the waves is the one who's going to later on in Matthew's gospel go to that cross to die for our failings, our sins, and our wrongs so that we could be forgiven and brought into God's family forever. He does not abandon those that he paid such a high price to get. One of the elements of fear is just um, is the unexpected. So in those moments of fear, there's questions, isn't there, that we can't answer. What if they don't make it? What if I don't make it? What's, what's going to happen next? And not knowing, that's what's fearful. I think that's why I'm so afraid of the sea. I don't like being in something when I'm swimming in the ocean and not knowing what's underneath me. It kind of freaks me out, all the creatures that could be there. You can look to yourself with all these uncertain, unexpected questions, but you can't get the answers. We need to know the one who is above it all and how he has both control and compassion on us. He has already dealt with our biggest threat. It wasn't storms, it was our sin. And so whilst life might be filled with uncertainties, we don't need to be uncertain about the one who controls them. Look at Jesus and we see one who is immensely powerful yet gracious and loving and we need to hear his voice saying to us, I am, do not be afraid. Nothing surprises him. He's in charge of it all. 
Secondly, do not doubt. When Jesus approaches, Matthew records a very unique incident. The other gospel writers don't record this, um, but Matthew does. Um, he approaches the disciples. He tells them not to be afraid. Now look at ver- with me at verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. So Peter, there's a boldness to him. It's a courage to him. He, he really does show great faith in Jesus. Jesus, he says to him, look, call me out. And Jesus calls him. He responds. And as such, Peter is able to do the impossible himself. Not by his own power, but by Christ's power. He walks on top of the waves. But I think Jesus is wanting to teach Peter and indeed all his church something key. If God's people are to do anything that God commands, we need to not be confident in ourselves but in him. We don't just start out in faith when we follow Jesus. We keep going in faith. Because look at what happens. Verse 30, But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Peter's out there, what an extraordinary scene. Standing on the waves, confident in Jesus, eyes fixed on them. And then he stops and he starts to look around and he realizes that he's standing on top of water. And there's a storm round about him. And he sees the wind and the waves and everything that's happening round about him. And he starts to sink. Peter's name literally means rock. Uh, And here he is very much being a rock. What does he do? Like David in Psalm 18, he cries out, Lord, save me. And what does the Lord do? Same thing he did in Psalm 18. He immediately reaches out and pulls him in. Do you know something? Peter shows us that even the most determined disciple of Jesus will be a mixture of faith and doubt. Isn't that a comfort? Jesus' right-hand man, the rock upon which he's going to build his church. He had fears, he had doubts. He bottled it, he messed up majorly. Keep reading Matthew, you'll see that. Even the most daring of us will be that contradiction. There will be days where we feel confident in Christ and days where our faith seems feeble, where fear and doubt swell around us and we just, we just don't see them. So if that's you, you're not alone. <laughs> but, but Jesus doesn't say to Peter and to us, oh, that's fine, we're all like that. He doesn't say that. No, he says, You have little faith. Why do you doubt? There's a rebuke there. That's a good question, by the way. If you are doubting, here's a great question to ask. Why? You see, even, see, when we, we often think doubts are rational. Often they're not. Peter has got full assurance in front of him, but he turns away from it. The evidence is right there, but he is ignoring the evidence and becoming concerned with these things round about him. And so we should ask, what causes our doubt? Because the evidence, the assurance is here, but we often turn from it and something else just takes over. I remember hearing Tim Keller saying this. I thought this was a really helpful phrase. Um, He says, when it comes to doubt, doubt your doubts. They're not often reasonable. They're not often evidence-based. Doubt them. Why am I doubting? Question them. Peter stopped looking at Jesus, and instead he focused on the danger that was around him, consumed by the chaos, and he just lost sight. And it seems, not only has he lost sight of Christ, but he's just looking to himself and his own concerns. You do that, and you will sink. Look, Jesus hasn't called you to walk on water. He's not called any of us to do that. You can go and try it if you want. I suggest you bring a towel. That's unique to this passage. But he has called you to live for him, to speak for him, to trust in him. 
And whilst we want to be obedient to that call, it feels really hard when life's battering us. But we mustn't focus on the threats, on our feelings, on what's happening. Don't ignore them, but we don't focus on ourselves and how well we're doing. Instead, we must look to him and trust him. Honestly, see if people are doubting and struggling, I often find that comes from an absence, after an absence of reading and praying. Jesus has just kind of come out of focus. And we start to look at the storm rather than the one who controls the storm. Look to him. Get in your Bible. Pray. Spend time with his people. Do it all to get your eyes on the one who has saved us. Like Peter, we cried out, Lord, save me. And he reached in and he pulled us out of judgment, pulled us into his kingdom, into eternal life with him. That's our certainty, our assurance. It's not ourselves and how well we do, but it's in him and his saving power. Have faith in him every step of the way. Finally, how should we respond? (coughs) Worship. Verse 32. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. You've just got to do that if you, when you see who he is. It's not just that, that the more we see of him, the more we're able to get through fear and anxiety and doubt. There's also that positive that we actually want to do something, and that's worship because of who he is. You see, we all worship something. You just ask yourself, what is it you live for? What is it you cannot live without? That's what you worship. But if it's not God, ultimately that will let you down. And yet here he is, God, standing on top of the waves. And when you see him in his goodness and his glory, the only appropriate response is to bow down and worship. And I want you to notice something. There's another miracle that happens here, and I missed it. I wonder if you missed it. What happens to the storm as soon as Jesus goes in the boat? We miss that. He stops it. That's probably a greater miracle if we can rank them than walking on the waves. That's another incident. Yeah, another very similar incident. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in an instant, he stops the storm. The chaos, the evil, the suffering of life, We need to see that not only does Jesus stand above it, not only is he in control of it, but we need to see that he will end it. He stops it. So much of Jesus' church throughout history, until he comes back, will go through great hardships. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Acts 14, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And look, we don't know why. I don't know why we have to go through what we go through, why the church has to go through it, why as individuals in our lives, we have to go through these things. And the Bible doesn't tell us why, but it shows us who. It shows us who is in control of it. It shows us who is sovereign. And what we see here is not only is he in control, not only does he care, but he has the power and he will one day end it all all the pain, all the suffering. The storm's just temporary. I mentioned, uh, obviously it's been kind of dominating my mind this past week, that our wee boy Finley had his tonsils out and, uh, you know, poor wee man's in in a lot of pain. Last night he was in a lot of pain. And I'm not sure if he knows why we let that happen to him. But we did it out of love. We let him suffer, which we did, because it was for his ultimate good. It's only an injection, is it like that? Yeah. And we were saying to him last night, um, because he was in a lot of pain last night, we were just saying, look, it will pass. It will pass. Don't worry. It will stop. Through all the sufferings and the hardships, Jesus will build his church 
and the pain and the hurt and the storms and the confusion and the chaos and the anxiety, it will pass. It will pass. They will die down and they will cease. And this light and momentary affliction will not be worth comparing with the glory that awaits us in eternity, as the Apostle Paul says. And it's then we will see him as he is, we'll see it wasn't pointless and we will worship. Do not lose sight of the one who runs this world and who will build his church. Look to him and you will see you can trust him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this short story in which Jesus shows us who he is and help us, Father, therefore, just to see that today and throughout this week, to see the one who stands supreme above it all, the one who's in control of it all, the one who cares for his people, the one who will build his church. Help us see him. Help us not to be afraid in the uncertainties of life. Help us not to doubt when we feel overwhelmed and help us instead to look at Christ and to worship and to trust him, knowing that he is good and he is sovereign. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, we're going to sing, but before we do, just any questions or thoughts? Thank you. So this verse is good for if you're having doubt. Eh, I think so. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly exactly it. A really helpful passage to go to. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think we all do that. Yeah. And we just need help to get the gaze back on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. He does. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I think there's. He he does. It's not that he has. He just doesn't say you have no faith. Yeah. He just has little faith. Um, and I think Jesus is not like, he doesn't want to say to us, that's fine. Um, we, we, we mentioned before, we're saved not through the strength of our faith, but the object of our faith, which is Christ. Nevertheless, Jesus wants us to have a lot of faith. Um, and so there's gentleness, there's encouragement, there's rebuke as well, I think, to him and to all of us to, to keep trusting. Um, because it's easy not, yeah, like I can, I can follow Jesus and have faith he's going to save me from my sins. There's so many times in life where I don't trust I think him. I we... sensitive to it. I think we've talked about this. Yeah. Before. It's kind of like, hurt by it. No. You know, I've yeah. been out in a... Does he not expect us to be like that, though? Yeah, I think there is. I think there's an expect, he, I mean, this is like, it's like I was saying, the best of us is a mixture of doubt and faith. Yeah. But he also, I mean, earlier in Matthew, he set a standard for his followers where he said, be perfect, as I am perfect. And it's not that he expects that we all will be perfect in every way, but nevertheless, it's the standard we work towards. But he knows we're going to sin because then he sent his son to die. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he does. He knows, that's what's, he's gracious, but he's also, um, yeah, he also wants us to live, he wants us to live life to the full, and that as a life to the full is a life of obedient faith. Yeah, because yeah, otherwise we will feel like we're sinking a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, there's a rebuke. I think there's an encouragement behind the rebuke as well. Um, well, sorry, Gaynor. Yeah. It's, like, it's like in school, that hand was right. <laughs> Believed in God, yeah. No. Yeah. Well, he, he said that, you know, before he, when he first met Jesus, he said, get away from me. I'm a sinner. You can't be near me. So he's very self-aware. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
<laughs> I don't know, maybe. But what he didn't know, he believed in God, he certainly a committed Jewish man, but what I don't think he knew was that Jesus was God. And he, well, yeah. Uh, he, I mean, he makes a few mistakes later on as well, even when he gets it. So, he, like I said, he's just representative of all of us. We so fluctuate very often, and he's just very, he wears his heart on his sleeve, so you know where, what's going on with him. Um, but I think, like, yeah, he, 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 he's getting it, but he's not quite getting it. And we'll see in a few weeks that he makes this great confession of faith, and Jesus is like, whoa, Peter, this is amazing. And then he mucks it up, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So he, he just kind of goes between the backwards and forward. But Peter's trying, uh, Jesus is trying to encourage him, refine his faith, and encourage all of us um, to, to learn from Peter. Yeah, well, we all can. And the great thing is that um, the, the word that's repeated in the passage that I didn't take note of is the word immediately. Everything Jesus does is instant. It's not about Peter. It's not about us. He just does it. Um, and so it's all about him. It's slow to anger. Yeah, well, yeah, slow to anger. But it's the same thing with them. He rescued them just like that um, through the Red Sea. And, yeah. Tam, did you have one question? We'll just, and then we'll yeah, sing. Yeah, when I came up to address everyone like I am, it took you back to school, for school years. Yeah. I am the physical. Right. I am the spiritual. I am the old. That was it. Not yeah, it's a good name, isn't it? It encompasses everything. He just is. Never Eternal and good. Thing. You never forget him. Yeah. Good. James, last one, and then we are, this is, we are going to sing. Because that's where, you know, when we, when, we, when we take our eyes, you know, we're, when we're self reliant and we sort of trust in ourselves and not trust in Him, that's when doubts begin to creep in our fears. Yep. And it's just, and that's where we ought to have a humbleness about that because if we keep our eyes on Him, it doesn't mean we're not going to face suffering, it's not we will take hardship and reject it. But if we keep our eyes on Him, that's when, you know, all those things we can, our doubts can be swayed Absolutely. That's when we can really, even through those difficulties, we know that he is just there for us, he loves us. And he ultimately loves us. Yeah, so, and that's the key thing, isn't it? We want to keep our eyes fixed on God. Um, and so we're going to, we're actually going to do that just now, um, remind ourselves of that by singing Psalm 93. Um, which talks about God's sovereignty over the storms. Um, just remain seated. This is a new song. This is a sovereign grace version of this psalm. Um, so Rachel and Ali are going to play through it. Just remain seated. And they're going to play, um, play through the first verse and chorus, just so we can learn it briefly. So they're going to play the first verse and chorus. And then once they've done that, we'll all stand and we'll, we'll sing that um, first verse and chorus again. So just remain seated just now.
majesty crown with strength and glory holy is our king behold him though the waters rage breakers bow before him tides rush to we close. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Please do have a seat. Tea and coffee. Remember sign up for house group. Conversation Cafe tomorrow.